<laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome on the fourth meeting of Zero X Poland. I'm super excited today. Uh, we're going to do some really exciting things. So without further ado, let's let's see what's going to happen. So uh, first of all, I want to give a shout out to our organizer, Ifworks and Maker, uh, thanks to whom it's all possible. And uh, I want to thank th say thanks to our media partners, CryptoDev.tv and Zuzumit Bitcoina, who help us promote ZeroX Poland and help us in our mission to uh, bring more software developers to blockchain and Ethereum space. And I want to remind everyone who don't remember yet that we have a student workshops coming any week now. So please subscribe. You go to students. Uh, students. Zeroxpoland.dev. Let's see if we can if we can see the address in the bottom corner. And if you're a student or if you're a fresh graduate or you know how to code and you want to learn how to code Ethereum, make sure to subscribe. Make sure to sign up and join the workshops. Uh, and finally, I want to remind you there is a hackathon coming uh, in, in May. Uh, the the date has uh, dates has changed a little bit since the last time we talked. So it's two weeks hackathon starting on May, May 14th. We're going to announce the sponsors and we're going to announce the speakers pretty soon, any week now. So make sure you follow us on Twitter. Make sure you follow us um on different channels uh, to see where the when the announcement going to be but i can today confirm that we have forty thousand dollars in awards so you can see already it's going to be pretty high profile thing and so join the discord follow us on twitter make sure you stay tuned to make sure you know what's going on and for today i'm super excited to announce our today's speakers and I, I, I think I'm especially proud we get to this moment, this first three meetings were kind of laying out the basics, explaining the blockchain, expecting it, explaining Ethereum, Solidity, DeFi, a lot of basic things. And today we finally getting to the point, we're getting to the edge, we're getting to the verge, we're getting to where the things are happening on the blockchain now. And the topic for today is layer two solutions or level two solutions. And we have two amazing guests. One is Bartek Kiepuszewski from Maker, who is co with whom we're co-organizing the whole event. And Bartek is a um, well legendary person in Polish blockchain space and beyond. He worked on tons of very important parts in the Maker DAO ecosystem. And he gonna do today an introduction to level two solutions uh, on the blockchain. And as a second guest, we're going to have Alex Guchowski. Alex is a CEO of ZK Sync, which is a leading zero knowledge based scalability solution, a layer two solution for Ethereum that is completely over, uh, completely over uh, open source. And it's getting a lot of traction right now. And there is a lot of very interesting things going on uh, in, in this space. And Alex just announced some very interesting things a few days ago. So he's going to talk about, about the compatibility between ZK Sync and Ethereum and Solidity. So we're going to talk about all of that today. Yeah, without further ado, really, really excited. And um, I let Bardek take over. So Bardek is joining us. Bardek, I think you need to share your screen. And when you do, we're going we're gonna to switch. Yeah, I'm leaving you with Bardek. Right. Uh, thanks, uh, Marek, so much. Uh, super excited to be here. Um, my name is Bartek uh, Kipuszewski. I'm with Maker for the last three years. And um, uh, this is really the intro uh, to uh, some of the more, uh, much more advanced topics, uh, I guess. And, and I kind of decided that uh, whenever I talk about rollups or different scaling solutions, uh, I think uh, it's actually quite important to understand uh, what is the reason uh, why it's so hard uh, to actually scale uh, blockchains while retaining uh, the permissionless nature 
uh, of permissionless blockchains. So, so treat it as a bit of a uh, background uh, info, uh, as an intro to a much more advanced talk uh, that we'll. Uh, my understanding is that uh, that's going to follow uh, mine. Uh, so I'm super excited. Uh, I hope that I can learn a lot from the subsequent talk uh, as well. Uh, but uh, going back to the basics, uh, let's see uh, why uh, blockchain validation is actually so uh, important and uh, why uh, this is foundational uh, to how we actually architect scaling solutions. So uh, back to the basics. Um, Essentially, um, Ethereum, uh, similarly to Bitcoin, you can think about uh, Ethereum as uh, a blockchain that uh, down uh, at the database level consists of blocks uh, and uh, these blocks need, need to propagate uh, across the network. And uh, all these blocks, they contain transactions uh, and they are propagated uh, in, in a gossip network between the different blockchain nodes, right? So this is more or less how it happens. Uh, there are some uh, mining nodes. Uh, they uh, are trying to find a new block. Uh, each block contains transactions. And uh, whenever the miner announces that the new block is found, uh, they will actually uh, propagate this block across the network. And that that actually takes some time. Uh, but eventually, all the nodes participating in the network, uh, they should receive the same block. I'm kind of uh, ignoring, you know, uh, sync problems. I'm ignoring the problem of two different miners finding uh, different blocks in, in more or less the same time. So uh, just for the sake of simplicity, let's just simply assume that uh, after a while, uh, we're going to end up uh, every single node uh, will eventually end up with uh, a block that's uh, been created by uh, one of the miners. Now, what's inside the block? And I think uh, this is actually uh, something that's uh, interesting uh, so that we understand what are the scalability problems. Um, each block contains a bunch of transactions uh, and all these transactions, they somewhat change uh, the blockchain state. Uh, so, as much as the state can uh, represent anything, uh, we will sort of consider, you know, a simple scenario where the state is simply the uh, list of balances of some token. In this uh, particular case, it's MKR token. And let's just have a look at this simple example, right? This is the initial state, uh, Bob with 1000 MKR, Alice with 200 and Charlie with zero. And there's a list of transactions that should be processed uh, from the top to the bottom. and uh, the question is, what should be the uh, the post state? Uh, so I'm going to pause for a second uh, for all of you to think. How many uh, tokens uh, Alice will have once this block is actually processed? So it should be a very easy question, I guess. And uh, all of you that... Uh, and the top with uh, 500, uh, they are right. Uh, whoever came with a different number, you know, they have to sort of uh, consider the fact that the last transaction from Bob will fail because he doesn't have 600 MKR. So even though, you know, he tried to send Ali 600 MKR, th that final transaction uh, will fail. And any node that actually validates the transaction will simply uh, ignore it and uh, the final state from Alice is 500 MKR. Uh, so obviously, you know, we should be very uh, uh, interested in making sure that we do understand the final state because, you know, if we are mistaken, uh, what is the balance of uh, Alice or whoever, um, that can result in double spending, that can result in all sorts of problems, right? So blockchain um, at its core, uh, it's really a state machine. It sort of takes a pre-state, uh, a bunch of transactions, and it computes the post-state. The thing is that on a technical level, uh, we do not store the state inside the block. It's impossible. It's just too much, right? On Ethereum, state is huge. Uh, it's right now, I think uh, it's over 60 uh, gigabytes, maybe more. Uh, and instead of storing the whole state, we actually compress it into one hash uh, using you know, some more or less advanced uh, crypto techniques. Uh, 
Um, but the point is that, you know, at the end of the day, uh, all we store inside the blockchain is what we call a, a state commitment. It's a hash uh, that is computed uh, from the whole state, right? So just by looking at the block, uh, we do not know uh, how uh, many MKR tokens Alice has, but we can actually compute it ourselves knowing the pre-state, the sequence of transactions and the post-state. Um, actually, the pre-state is not needed because the pre-state is the post-state of the previous block, but, uh, but uh, I'm sure that you get the point, right? So again, um, how does it look like from the user's perspective? Well, there's miner finding a new block, there's user that uh, learns about the new block, and now in most circumstances, the user will be interested in actually knowing what is the current state, right? So what are the options for the user? Uh, they can actually ask the miner, right? They can ask the miner what is the state, and the miner can reply, um, and maybe this is good for the user, but, uh, but frankly, even though the miner has computed the block uh, and they claim that this is the post state, uh, well, there is no way to know. Uh, so really, um, without doing anything else, we're back to trusting the miner, right? And the miner can lie for whatever reason. Uh, so the easy way to actually uh, find out if uh, the miner is not lying is to simply validate the state uh, ourselves, right? So this way, we do not have to trust the miner. We do not have to compute this. Uh, we do not have to uh, get this info from the miner. All we need to do is to look at the blockchain, look at the list of transactions, and we can actually compute the state ourselves. And this is literally how the Bitcoin work and how the Ethereum works. And this is how people running so-called full nodes um, uh, participate in the network. Uh, and this is crucial, right? Because uh, being able to validate the blockchain uh, actually allows us to not trust the miners, right? It allows us to sort of look at miners as um, entities uh, doing some service for us, but at the end of the day, there is no trust uh, relationship with the miners, right? So once we verify, we can be sure that uh, Bob has 400 MKR and we can do whatever we want to do with this information. Now, if you look at the full network, uh, you'll see that there are different participants, right? Uh, there are people that are mining blocks. There are full nodes that are verifying these blocks. But uh, to verify the block, uh, you actually need to run the full node. You need to have uh, a computer that does that. So obviously, not everybody will do it. Uh, there will be users uh, relying on some extra uh, providers. And they will be sort of relying on, on, on other full nodes to provide them with uh, whatever information they want, right? And they will establish some sort of a trust relationship with these nodes. So, um, so let's see uh, what happens when something goes wrong, right? Uh, the miner uh, mines a block. Uh, they claim that this is the post state. And upon verification, um, I mean, and, and we need to be able to actually verify this, right? Uh, so as you may be aware on Ethereum network, uh, every single new block uh, is added to the blockchain every 15 seconds. And as long as I can keep up with the blockchain, as long as I can verify that block in this uh, time window, I should be okay. I don't need to trust the miner. But what if instead of uh, 15 seconds uh, and let's say 300 transactions, uh, suddenly now um, there's like a supercomputer, right, on the mining side. And they actually put a lot of transactions inside the block, like 20,000 transactions. Uh, how am I supposed to verify that? You know, I may not be able to keep up. Uh, so because I can't keep up and I cannot validate the block myself, well, I need to... Right now, I mean, I'm at the mercy of the miner, right? I cannot verify all these blocks. So my computer is just not fast enough. And I need to ask the supercomputer about the state. Um, so really, um, running a validating node on a consumer-grade laptop is actually necessary if we don't want to trust miners. Uh, and uh, at, at the bottom of all the scalability problems for blockchains, uh, 
lies the problem of the speed of validation, right? And this is a real scalability bottleneck. And this is actually confusing for a lot of people because they kind of assume that uh, it's okay for miners to actually have all these super fast computers. Well, actually it's not, right? There's literally nothing right now on Ethereum uh, stopping us from increasing the block size and from reducing the other time between blocks. But if we did that, uh, then the, the network, uh, we won't be able actually to validate independently the network. And same with Bitcoin, right? It's even uh, the trust assumptions uh, on Bitcoin network are even lower uh, so that the, uh, the time between blocks is even longer and the blocks are smaller. So it takes actually less time to validate blocks. It makes it much easier for anyone uh, to uh, run the full node. Um, so what would happen if everybody like colludes and everybody was evil, right? So the miner actually mines a, a fraudulent block and uh, they actually include a, a fraudulent transaction inside the block. Well, everybody's lying on the network. However, uh, uh, there is just one guy, right? Just one full node in the whole network uh, that is not colluding. Right, so uh, we call it the one honest node uh, security assumption. And if th there is just one guy that doesn't trust everybody else, and they are able to independently verify the network, they can raise an alarm, right? And because they raise an alarm, uh, we kind of hope uh, that uh, other users that are relying on other nodes, uh, which again they are lying, right? And they don't know that, but they hear the alarm from this one honest validator. Um, they will sort of propagate this alarm and, and now some sort of a chaos will spread across the network and maybe other users uh, will uh, launch or will spin off their own uh, nodes and they will actually verify that indeed the rest of the network is colluding, right? And, uh, and, and we will be able to literally reject uh, that uh, network that's actually fraudulent. And I think it's important to understand that all it takes for this to happen is one honest validator, right? So this one honest validator assumption, uh, this is not like 51% attack or anything like that. I mean, it takes one full node to validate the blockchain as long as, of course, we can actually do it, right? Um, so to sum up, uh, it's other miners that actually validate uh, other miners, full node users, they also validate miners. And as a result on public Bitcoin and Ethereum network, uh, miners just simply don't cheat, right? I mean, Bitcoin is um, on for the last over 10 years, Ethereum last six years or so. And uh, I've never heard about uh, any single incident of any single miner, including uh, non valid transaction inside the block, which is interesting because there's literally nothing stopping them to do so. However, no miner, as to the best of my knowledge, has ever done that. Um, so as you can see, um, it is possible that miners can include the invalid transactions. They just simply don't do it, right? Because they would be immediately caught uh, cheating and the rest of the network uh, will uh, reject them. And all it takes is the one honest full note for this to happen. And this is why we uh, insist that it should be possible on a public blockchain for anybody with decent computing power and not a you know huge data center or supercomputer to actually be able to validate independently from the rest of the network um, the state of the blockchain. So this is this is the uh, the, the the foundation, right? Uh, now let me introduce uh, another concept because everything that I said so far. Uh, it's actually uh, around what we call uh, optimistic verification, right? So the miner, uh, which we will call uh, subsequently an optimistic miner, uh, they will not provide any kind of a proof that the state uh, is actually correct. If you look, if you go to the Etherscan and if you look at the transactions, uh, you will see in Etherscan a block and you will see the uh, state commitment. You have to just trust. There is no proof that this is the correct state, right? You can verify it yourself independently, but you have to trust it. And remember that uh, for this to work, uh, 
the state cannot be huge and uh, we put uh, artificial constraints on the size of the uh, block, right? And this is why we can only put so many transactions inside the blockchain. Now, there's another technique and uh, you will learn about the details of this technique uh, in the uh, subsequent presentation. And that is that the miner not just uh, tells us the uh, post state, but also uh, they provide the uh, cryptographic proof, which we call a zero knowledge proof that the state is indeed correct. Um, so, so this is the proof that's literally proved that the miner is not lying. And this is the cryptographic proof that this post state is actually a valid post state after uh, processing all these transactions that are inside the block. So uh, you can see immediately that now I do not have to verify anything really, because I, I can be certain that this post state is correct. And now, suddenly I can think about scaling it much more, right? Because the, the, I can imagine that there's this uh, zero knowledge super fast miner uh, that actually puts a big bunch of transactions. And all I need to do is to look at the proof. And if I see that the proof is actually correct and I can do it on even my phone, uh, then I'm certain that the post state is correct, right? So it sort of looks as if, well, zero knowledge proofs, you know, they actually solve the scalability problem, right? All we need to do is to include zero knowledge proof and we can make uh, blocks as big as we want and the scalability issue is gone. Well, uh, there's just one more problem, unfortunately, and that is that even though I know that the post state is correct, um, all I can see on the blockchain is the state commitment. I still don't know what is the, uh, the actual state. Uh, it's just a commitment, right? So I'm back to the question of finding out uh, what is actually a state? What is Bob's balance, uh, if that's what I'm interested in? And well, I can ask the miner. A miner can actually give me a state and what they can give me is so-called inclusion proof. And I can check if indeed that state uh, is part of, of that commitment. I can verify independently uh, that uh, miner is not lying. So uh, I don't need to trust miner. However, uh, even though I don't need to trust miner, I need to get this answer uh, from miner and that inclusion proof. If the miner, for whatever reason, refuses uh, to give me this answer, uh, like for example, I mean, they're happy to, to give me the, uh, the answer for Bob, but for whatever reason, they don't want to give me the answer for Alice, well, um, then I do have a problem because I just don't know, right? And, and we will uh, maybe talk uh, about this a little bit later. And, uh, but, but again, uh, this is actually something that um, is a known problem uh, in, uh, in all scalability solutions. Uh, if I don't get the answer from the miner, uh, I need to recompute the state myself. And if that state is huge, then I will need a lot of computing power to actually do so. It's not impossible to do, uh, but uh, I'm kind of back to uh, the scalability problem um, one way or the other. All right, so, so that was sort of the, uh, the foundational background. So let's have a look at the, uh, uh, at the actual rollups. What is a rollup? Because I mean, everything that I said up to that point uh, is kind of independent from the actual uh, L2. What is L2 and how does that relate to L1? Well, it's actually super simple when you think about it. Uh, it's a way to sort of pack uh, one blockchain inside of another by simply uh, putting a block of the, uh, what we call an L2, like layer two blockchains uh, as a one, transaction inside, uh, inside of L1 blockchain, right? So again, on the left, you have the uh, your L1 blockchain, like Ethereum, and you've got uh, all uh, transactions that you put inside the block. And we can imagine that there's one uh, transaction that contains a state commitment from another blockchain, from another block, right? So it's almost like a, like a recursive structure. Uh, so inside this one state commitment, we can pack uh, the whole block with its own post state uh, as just one transaction. So you can clearly see that, you know, by doing this, we can pack uh, a lot of transactions inside uh, 
<clears throat> the L1 block, and we can do it recursively. You can imagine that, uh, having L3 uh, blockchain, L4 blockchains, and so on, and uh, and <clears throat> you'll end up with literally unlimited scalability if you actually chose uh, to do so. And again, uh, two different options, uh, optimistic uh, rollup, minor, we call it a rollup, uh, this um, second layer solution, and um, <clears throat> zero knowledge minor that will not only they will uh, need to provide the, uh, the post state, but uh, uh, they will also need to provide the zero knowledge proof uh, so that uh, anybody uh, who's actually observing L1 and L2, they uh, are certain that this policy is correct. With the optimistic rollup, uh, again, uh, we're back to this verification game. We need to sort of look at all these transactions from L2, and uh, and we need to independently verify uh, the post state. And again, all it needs uh, for this construction to work uh, is the uh, one honest validator assumption. Now, why this is called a rollup? Uh, it's called a rollup because uh, not only state is posted uh, to L1, but also all these transactions are packed and they are kind of included uh, not as a state of L1, but they are, let's say, transferred uh, to uh, L2 when this transaction is included, right? So we can reconstruct uh, the state of L2 just by looking at the uh, L1. And that's why it's called a rollup because I mean the state and all the transactions of L2 are sort of uh, packed inside uh, this uh, big uh, package and uh, it's actually uh, included inside L1. So let's uh, just uh, look at the, uh, um, the details again. Uh, we've got the uh, ZK uh, miner, they provide the ZK proof um and well uh with and and, and we are certain that uh, this uh, new block on l2 is correct because there's a proof right i mean they cannot cheat uh, well with the optimistic miner is a little bit different situation uh and they can cheat uh, we need to trust them uh, so it is possible, in theory, at least, that, uh, that this on, one honest validator, they actually uh, find that this state commitment uh, is actually wrong. Uh, so they need to raise an alarm, right? And uh, the way it actually works is that uh, if anyone uh, verifies the, uh, the block and they find that the state commitment uh, is wrong, uh, they can submit uh, what's called a fraud proof. Uh, to L1, to a smart contract on L1, and um, once the fraud proof is verified, uh, this new state uh, will be rejected uh, by L1, right? And of course, you know, there must be some sort of a crypto economic mechanism to punish the miner, but, uh, but this is sort of uh, aside. Uh, at the bottom of the whole construction is the uh, uh, the ability for anyone to verify uh, the state commitment and uh, to be able to submit a fraud proof. And uh, because it takes some time and because, you know, people uh, or, or these nodes may be offline, uh, well, uh, every single uh, roll-up construction, uh, optimistic roll-up construction, they actually include what we call a fraud proof window. Uh, which is literally the time that uh, the honest validator have uh, to uh, submit the fraud proof. And uh, typically it's, uh, it's about a week uh, or maybe even two weeks, depending on the, uh, the actual uh, rollup. And after that time, it's just simply assumed that the state is correct, right? And again, uh, if we're interested in actual state, like the question, what is Bob's MKR balance on L2, we run into the same problem. Uh, we, we literally uh, either run full node or trust uh, somebody who does uh, run the full node. So this problem of actually computing the state is very, very uh, same as on L1. Uh, we either trust uh, <clears throat> somebody who does that or we are able to compute the state ourselves. Um, so this whole construction sort of brings us to what is probably the most com 
contentious issue uh, when we compare optimistic rollups and ZK rollups. And that is the uh, the, uh, the withdrawal problem, so-called withdrawal problem. So imagine now that uh, L2 uh, blockchain is like a casino. Uh, you enter a casino, you, you buy uh, casino chips. Uh, and you play all sorts of games uh, inside the casinos and this, these are all the transactions that are happening on the uh, l2 blockchains and then after a while you actually want to go back so you probably want to uh, exchange uh, your chips back to cash right and then and, and typically when you exit the casino i mean there are places to do that right so the happy path uh, is kind of simple the users, uh, they are asking the L2 miner whether they can withdraw tokens from L2. And the happy path is that the miner verifies this transaction. Uh, and um, with the optimistic rollup, uh, because the miner can uh, cheat, uh, we actually have to wait uh, through this fraud proof window. And this is probably one of the uh, the biggest uh, drawbacks of the uh, optimistic rollup construction. Um, we have to make sure that uh, the uh, the miners uh, state that's committed on L1, uh, this is actually correct. Uh, so that the miners are cheating. Uh, for ZK rollups, this is not the problem because miners uh, cannot cheat. But uh, but that's uh, only when miners actually uh, respond, right? What happens when the miner is down? Uh, and this is a bad scenario, right? Because, I mean, this is literally, imagine yourself trying to get out of a casino, trying to exchange your chips, but uh, there, are, there is nobody there, right? Uh, it's just closed. So all you have is your chips, uh, but you want real cash, right? And and you wait and you wait, and then, you know, suddenly you learn that uh, maybe the casino is bankrupt and uh, they just simply don't have any cash, right? And you're left with those plastic chips. Um, which is probably not what you wanted when you were playing the games in the casino. So this is a sad scenario, the down operator. Uh, the new blocks are not produced and we need to actually make sure that there's some sort of a way for end users to withdraw uh, these MKRs uh, or these tokens from L2, even though the L2 miner uh, is down, right? Uh, so this is normally possible uh, for any rollup construction or at least it should be possible for any roll-up construction, but uh, it needs to be kind of remembered that uh, for this to actually be possible, you need to be able to produce a state. Uh, so you need to make sure that you can actually uh, compute state and validate the state, right? So again, we're back to this state validation uh, issue that uh, I talked about earlier. And I guess probably the most tricky scenario is when the uh, the miner is actually censoring particular users. Uh, <clears throat> so maybe uh, when Alice wants to withdraw tokens, uh, the miners will respond. But when the Bob wants to withdraw tokens, the miners sort of pretend uh, that they haven't heard Bob's request. Uh, so so this is hard because it's impossible to prove whether indeed uh, the miner is censoring or whether Bob is cheating and, you know, he's actually telling everybody that uh, he's being censored, but in fact, you know, they never, uh, Bob, uh, they never sent uh, the withdrawal request, right? So this is a known problem in computer science and, and, and this is a very tricky and interesting issue. And again, there must be sort of some kind of a um, anti-censoring uh, protection for end users and if indeed Bob feels like they are censored there must be a way for them to to, to circumvent the miner uh, so I would normally expect from any rollup solution to actually provide end users with uh, a solution to this problem all right so um, the takeaways um, let's compare these two uh, uh, setup the optimistic rollups and seeker rollups well uh, the because there's the assumption for optimistic rollups that uh, everybody should be able to validate uh, the optimistic rollup and there should be this one honest validator, uh, a lot of people are regarding optimistic rollups as uh, what we call a sharding solution. Um, and they won't scale as much, uh, especially if everybody jumps on the same rollup or the same shard, uh, because uh, the validation of this optimistic rollup will be uh, this kind of constrained by, by, by 
the same problems as validating uh, Ethereum blockchains, right? So we'll literally move all the traffic to one from all L1 to one rollup uh, on L2. That's not going to solve uh, a lot. On the other hand, ZK rollups are true scaling solutions and uh, external validators are typically not required. And I say typically because uh, in a happy scenario, that's indeed true. Uh, the, there must be some solution to not that happy scenario when all the uh, uh, nodes on the Zika rollup chain are down for whatever reason, right? Then um, optimistic rollups uh, are actually easier. Uh, they don't rely on any uh, sophisticated math and sophisticated uh, cryptographic assumptions. They are probably much easier to verify and reason about, uh, but they do rely on, 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 on certain crypto economic assumptions, right? Uh, we do need to have at least one honest validator and we need, uh, we need to have some sort of incentives or incentive structure to make sure that the miners uh, do not cheat. Uh, similarly to Bitcoin or Ethereum, I mean, miners are actually um, incentivized not to cheat. Uh, on the other hand, ZK rollups, they do rely on cryptographic assumptions. Uh, uh, it's much more difficult to prove the correctness. Uh, and support for general smart contracts uh, is also much harder. And this is why uh, it is likely that we will see optimistic, gener generalized optimistic rollups uh, a little bit sooner. Um, and they will probably provide a short to medium term, term relief uh, to the current Ethereum congestion problem. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I believe that ZK Rollups eventually uh, will provide us with a solution to build generalized smart contracts. And once uh, everybody will be like uh, uh, certain that uh, this is correct and uh, and the crypto behind them uh, is sound, um, they will very likely provide uh, the final solution to, to, to scalability, right? And the withdrawal time, again, uh, one week or two week withdrawal time from optimistic rollups, so that can be uh, super problematic for a lot of use cases. However, I think it's worth uh, to understand that uh, there's already some interesting designs in the works that will solve the problem for uh, many use cases. So uh, MakerDAO, for example, is working on uh, one such uh, design uh, for withdrawal of DAI uh, tokens, the stable coin that uh, anybody can mint uh, using uh, MakerDAO system. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Zika rollups, they don't suffer from this problem. However, uh, when provers and miners on Zika rollups, they go dark, uh, then can be uh, very problematic as well for the end users. Um, very unlikely scenario, but again, uh, um, I think we should really, in, especially in blockchains, which are um, adversarial environments, we should always sort of uh, focus on the worst case scenario and ask uh, hard questions. And um, yeah, this is pretty much, uh, this pretty much sums up um, uh, the foundations. Uh, so I think we've got like maybe 10 minutes uh, for questions. Uh, and um, And yeah, so let's go to Q&A. Uh, hey, welcome back. Uh, let's wait. It's probably going to take a few minutes to take questions. I propose to take not too many questions yet. Let's do maybe two or three questions now. And then let's do a longer Q&I after Alec, uh, Alex's presentation. Uh, yeah. So, Bartek, thank you very much for your presentation in the meantime. It's uh, uh, super happy to have you here. And um, yeah, I hope I, I hope we finally get a little bit cloudy, foggy uh, terrain of layer two solutions gets a little bit more understandable. If it's not yet fully understandable, understandable, 
don't worry take your time it is a lot of information a lot of it feels very natural for me right now but i remember back in the days it was all very confusing with zero knowledge with optimism and all that stuff with roll-ups and so on and here we have a first question how the valid validator detects a badly working miner Anybody uh, should uh, be able to uh, validate uh, a block by simply taking uh, all the transactions, taking the pre-state and uh, uh, looking at the post state and seeing if it matches uh, with what was actually advertised by the miner, right? Uh, so this is literally like uh, how Ethereum and Bitcoin work on the base layer. And this is how you should be able to do it on a L2 layer as well. Right, so so it's it's the same technique. Uh, I take a pre-state, uh, I re, um, execute uh, all the transaction, uh, all the transactions in the sequence, and I should be able to compute what we call a post-state. And um, so, no difference really uh, on the on the rollup or L two from from basic L one. I think the difference is what do you do once you detect it. And on the main app, yes. Yeah. What do you do? Yeah. What do you do on the main net? That's a very good question. What do you do if it detects, you know, the uh, invalid block on the main net, right? <laughs> I mean, normally people don't think about it because they kind of assume that, that uh, all the blocks uh, are uh, correct. But what do they not? What do you do? Like I said in my presentation, I mean, normally you should be able to raise an alarm and you should be able to uh, reject such a block and not propagate it further in a gossip network. Uh, for the optimistic crawl-up, uh, what do you do when you actually uh, detect uh, a bad block? Uh, like I said before, you submit a fraud proof and uh, this fraud proof is actually submitted to a smart contract on L1 and uh, the smart contract um, will uh, verify the fraud proof and it will reject um, the block. Awesome. I think we have uh, at least one more question. Let's see if we can get it. Oh. What are um, the time frames of this? Let me read the question and I'll let you answer. What are the time frames of these solutions? Anything will be deployed this year? Good news coming, Bartek. Yeah, so uh, a lot of solutions are already out there uh, for Zika rollups, first Loopring, uh, first Diversify, um, Immutable for NFTs. Uh, they are, from what I'm hearing, quite uh, close to be ready. Uh, but these are all, uh, and of course, ZK Sync. Uh, and, and Alex will uh, tell you uh, much more about ZK Sync. Uh, so all these solutions are for Zika rollups are already out there. Uh, however, to the best of my knowledge, uh, they're not uh, general computation uh, solutions. They are specific solutions for specific uh, transaction types. Um, in the uh, optimistic space, uh, the uh, uh, VA again uh, versus Arbitrum versus Optimism and probably a few others. And optimistic rollup from Optimus, for example, is announced to be launched uh, quite soon, uh, I believe in March. Uh, so it's coming. It's it's actually very very uh, soon. Mm, really feels like it just around the block. So yeah. uh, we have a lot of more questions. So let's pick one. Then we have an Alex talk, and uh, then we go to questions. But like you, would you be avail available to questions after Alex talk? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll be hanging around for sure. Um, awesome. So. The last question before the next presentation, what is the incentive to prove the fraud when you're not a direct participant of a rollup? I believe it's the same incentive as for anyone to run a full node uh, on the blockchain. Like what is the incentive for anyone to run a full node? Uh, so think about uh, an exchange uh, that uh, swaps uh, tokens from one blockchain to another or swaps tokens from uh, a blockchain to 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 fiat. Uh, this is what exchanges do, and uh, given you know the uh, the huge uh, uh, um, amounts at stake, if you like, uh, they probably shouldn't trust any miners, right? Um, because if the miners collude, 
um, they could double spend the tokens and uh, the exchange will take huge loss. So every single centralized exchange that I know, they all run full nodes, right? They all are independently verifying blockchains. And so what is the incentive here? Uh, it will be very, very similar. If you, for whatever reason, uh, if you are interested in making sure um, that um, as soon as the new block on L2 is published on L1, uh, if you want to make sure that uh, um, this block is correct and the state commitment is correct, you probably should run a full node on L2 whatever your reasoning is behind it, right? So one interesting use case is somebody uh, trying to uh, make fast withdrawals possible, right? They can look at the L2 state, they can verify uh, that state, and if they are certain that the state is correct, they don't have to wait through this uh, one week or two week uh, window uh, because they are certain now that there'll be no fraud proof, right? Because the state is correct. The fraud proof is only possible if the state is wrong. But if I'm sure that the state is correct, that I can be certain um, that the state is correct, right? Marek can ask me if I'm running a full node, I can tell Marek, well, look, Marek, I mean, trust me, the state is correct. <laughs> but then, of course, you know, Marek needs to trust me, so maybe he doesn't trust me, so maybe he can run the full node himself, right, and just verify himself. Um, so I guess the incentive is for anyone uh, that does not want to wait uh, two weeks. Mm. It's a good one. Okay. Uh, I didn't thought about this last last, last part. Uh, with waiting, that's, that's a nice detail I was not realizing about optimistic rollup. If you run a full node, you don't need to wait. Uh, 